A little bit of wisdom goes a long way. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. My name is Elliot. My wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. Come on, clap your hands if you're happy to be here today. Lifeline Church is going down something fierce. First Sunday. First Sunday. I forgot to do this last service, so I definitely want to do it this service. Check this out. First Sunday of the year. And where are you? Right here in church, man. Good job for you. Come on, give it up for yourselves right now. Resolutions getting kept right now. That's good stuff. Resolutions getting kept. I love it. All right, we're starting a brand new series. It is a brand new year. It is a brand new you. And we're going to start a brand new series called A Little Bit of Wisdom Goes a Long Way. So I want to tell you a little bit about the series before we start. It is a series about the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is the book of wisdom, yo. King Solomon, King Solomon was known as the wisest man who ever lived, ever, anywhere, always, forever. King Solomon, wisest man ever. He wrote most of this book right here so we can know that this advice coming at us from the book of Proverbs is going to be the wisest stuff that anyone ever has to throw our way. And a little bit of, just, just a little bit of wisdom, everybody, can go a long way in your life. So go ahead and pull out those bulletin notes if you got them. I, I went extra I don't know if y'all can see that, but I went extra when it comes to your bulletin notes today. There's like uh, all these blanks, all these scriptures, man. It's all there, so I hope you enjoy that. I hope you get a lot out of that. But I want to tell you, why, why are we doing Proverbs first? There, there is a reason. There is a reason why we want to start this year off in the book of Proverbs, and it comes from the book itself. In Proverbs 4, verse 7, it says this, wisdom is, say it with me, supreme. It's first. It's number one. It's the top of God's list. So why shouldn't it be at the top of, a thank you so much. I'm going to take a drink of that right now. Thank you. Give it up for this man right here. Ooh, a cold drink of water too. Oh, it's just right. I don't care how cold it is outside. That always is going to taste good. All right. And where was I? Wisdom is supreme. It's number one. It's the first. So why shouldn't it be the first thing that we talk about in this new year? Wisdom. Wisdom is what we want. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Man, I don't care how big that check is. Write it. Because wisdom is worth paying money for. That's what the Bible says. Man, even if it costs you everything you have. But I'm telling you, all it's going to cost you is being in church the next six Sundays. That's all it's going to cost you. You're not going to have to pay everything you got. But the, but the Bible is making a very clear def declaration here. It's worth that much. It's worth everything you got to get wisdom. Because if you got wisdom, you will be short on nothing else in your life. Though it costs you everything. Wisdom in the Bible, the word wisdom actually means skilled living. It means skilled living. So it doesn't just mean head knowledge. He's not saying, you know, go out and get as much head knowledge as you can. Go ahead, get as much education as you can. Get as much knowledge as you can. No. He's saying, oh, I want you to have s skilled living. I want you to be able to live your life skillfully. Watch this. I'm going to explain it to you. Knowledge constructs the Titanic, but wisdom avoids the icebergs. Come on, somebody. You know that's good. That's good right there. That's a good illustration right there. You can have wisdom to build something great, but wisdom is going to keep you from harm. Come on, that's, that's good stuff. Knowledge builds a house. Wisdom builds a home. Knowledge builds a house. Like you may know, I, I know how to have a baby, everybody. I know how to, I know how to go and, and buy a house and, and get things going on or rent an apartment or whatever I need to do. But, but wisdom builds the home. Wisdom is what makes that house worth living in. That's wisdom right there. Knowledge understands God. Wisdom walks with God. 
So I don't want you to leave today just having more information about God. I don't want you to know more about God. I want you to know him for yourself. Because knowledge understands God, but wisdom walks with God. In fact, uh, the late, great Billy Graham said it this way. Knowledge is horizontal. Like you can get it from school. You can get it online. Please don't get your knowledge online. (laughs) You can get it from social media. Please don't get it from social media, everybody. But knowledge is horizontal. Like you can get it from wherever you're at. You can get it from life. You can get it from the person sitting next to you. Knowledge is horizontal. But wisdom is vertical. It comes from above. Having true wisdom comes from up here. That's it, period. Point blank, period. You can get your knowledge from anywhere you want, but wisdom comes from one place, comes from God. Now, there's something that I've seen. There's something that I've seen that, that troubles me a little bit in, in culture and society, um, in the workplace, everywhere else. It's, that, it's, this, it's this trend that we're, we're too smart for God. That I, I know the Bible says this, but we know that I don't have to do all that. I don't have, you know, it says all of this stuff, but I don't have to do all that. It's like when you're driving in your car and, and you see the, the speed limit sign and, you're, and you think to yourself, what do you think to yourself? You think, oh, I don't have to. I don't have to. I, I know it says that, but I won't get caught. Let me tell you something. There is a big difference between God and policemen. Uh, there's a big difference. I'm just telling you that God God is, he's real. He's supreme. So his knowledge is always true. His wisdom always works. And it's the trend that I see more and more of is that, oh, yeah, I know, I know the Bible says that, but we don't need to really, we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to worry about that. But, but this, listen to what the Bible says about that kind of thinking. Proverbs 26. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool then for him, somebody say fool. Fool, you guys like saying that. Like you guys practice saying that one. Fool, fool, that's very good. So we've all been there though. Uh, I'm not saying you haven't been there. I've been there. I've been there where I, I thought, I, you know, oh, I, I see that over there, but I don't need to do all that. But let me tell you, there's a way out. There is hope for every single person in this place. If, you've, if you can identify, if you can self-identify with that. I want to talk to you today about four people the book of Proverbs talks about the book of Proverbs talks about more people than that, but I just want to talk about these four people because they're the funniest. Come on, somebody. I like it funny. And I want to talk about these four funny people out of the book of Proverbs. Number one is this person right here in your notes. Number one, the simple. Somebody say simple. Not you. Now, I would never say this about you, but go ahead and, and look at the person next to you. Ask, are you taking notes about this one? Mm, the simple. The simple. The sim- I'm not name calling or anything like that. I would never do that. But let me explain to you who the simple person is. Let me explain what the simple person is. The simple person doesn't know something because nobody has told them. They're ignorant. They just don't know. They didn't know. Like they're walking this way. They're on the stage and they're, they're walking. They're looking at you. They're like, uh-huh, yeah, sounds good. Uh, whoa, they didn't know. They didn't know there was a cliff there. That's a simple person. And listen to what the Bible says about a simple person right here. Proverbs 7. He said, I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. What is this saying? That the simple people tend to be people who are younger. Tend to be, I'm just, I didn't say it, okay? I, I, I fall into that category. So obviously I didn't make this up because I would say it tends to be, you know, all those old people, man, they don't, they're, sim- they're the ones who don't know, right? But the young The young tend to be simple, and there's a little bit of simple in all of us. Let me just put that out there. No matter what your age is, you could tell a simple person because there usually is around simple people. There's there's people that say, no, don't do it. There's people all around the simple that say, don't do it. No, no, you don't do it. see the cliff right there. It's right. We can all see it. But you don't see it. But I'm trying to tell you it's there. No, don't kiss him. Don't kiss her. Don't spend the night. Don't watch that. Don't listen to that. I know it's right there. And they're like, doo, 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 just walking along. Simple. That's who a simple person is. Now, um, I got another little illustration for, for simple people. Now, you know, there's a lot of great philosophers in our day and age. You know that, right? 
a lot of really smart people out there, great philosophers in, in our culture, you know. So from the great philosopher, Taylor Swift, I want to give you a little bit of this wisdom right here. When you're 15, somebody tells you they love you, you're going to believe them. And isn't that true? You're 15, young and in love. And I, I, know I heard somebody, somebody of, a, uh, of a certain generation singing, they called it puppy love. And it's just dumb. It's just dumb. And you're 15. I know I'm not the only one who's ever felt this. Oh, but mommy, but daddy, she loves me. She's always there for me. But my soulmate, I found my soulmate, mommy. And that's the one. That's the one. Don't tell me I can't go see them tonight. Right? But they can, but your parents can see. The people in your life can see. Don't do it. He's lying to you. He doesn't love you. He loves some things about you, but he doesn't love you, you. He just loves parts of you. Okay? Because that, that's the truth. And the simple just wander straight into trouble for themselves. And that's what they do. This is who the simple is. The point is this. The point is this. We can't be the only people in our own lives giving ourselves advice. Otherwise, basically, you're a fool all over the book of Proverbs. You're a fool. And the, the simple people need people with, with knowledge, with understanding, speaking into their life. Simple people and that's a little bit of all of us. We need people in our lives that say, hey, check it out. There's a cliff over there. Hey, if you go and do that over there, you're going to fall and break your nose. Just saying. Just saying. Okay, so, and especially, and that's why we talk about life groups so much, by the way. By the way. This is why we're always talking after the, at the end of every message. I'm always like, life groups, life groups. Sign up for a life group. Don't do life alone. Blah, blah, blah. Why? It's because you need people in your life saying, no. Don't do it, especially if you're going through something hard, especially if you're going through a difficult time in your life, and you don't want to be caught, you don't want to be caught behind the game and say, well, now I'm in a difficult time. I better go get into a life group really quick. No, you need those people in your life before that time comes who could say, you know what, darling, maybe you shouldn't be kissing on him right now because it's just not good for you. And, you know, your life group can speak life into you. We all, myself, I need that too. People don't know, but I'm involved in a lot of friendships that keep me from going, oh, maybe we should go over here. You know, we all need this. We all need this in our lives. When you're going through something difficult, you are the last person you need to be receiving advice from. Okay? Let's just put it that way. The cure for the simple is this, time. When you're simple, you just need time. You need time to grow. You need time to mature. Or you need people who are mature in your life. You need to invite them in and say, hey, um, I'm simple. I don't know everything there is to know about life. So would you please be my friend and keep me from making a knucklehead out of myself. That's what we all need. That's the cure right there. So let's talk about person number two, my favorite person, the fool. The fool. Can we all say fool? You guys like saying that. Not me, though. Don't say that. How's that hurt? Let me, let me tell you how, how the fool is different from the simple person. The simple person doesn't know. The fool knows but doesn't care. That's a fool right there. In, in the flesh, that's a fool. I know there's a cliff right there, but I'm going to walk off anyway. Why? Why? Let's put that scripture up on the screen. Why, Why does a fool do that? A fool finds, ple it's fun. It's fun for a fool to be a fool. I like fooling around because it's fun. And you know what? To be honest, it is fun for a season until it's not until it catches up with you and bites you. In Hebrews, it talks about sin is pleasurable for a season, but it always, it, there's a promise attached to every sin. It comes back and it bites you and hurts you, but a fool, a fool looks at the bottle and says, don't drink this with other things, huh? Ah, it'll be fine. A fool says, you know, the label says do this, but I'll do another thing. The fool says, I hear you, but I'm going to do it anyways. And yet again, there's a little fool in all of us. There's a little bit of fool in all of us. Now, I have a lot to say about the fool because the fool is the person I feel most acquainted with uh, at most times. Um, I'm just being honest with y'all. I just, that, I mean, 
Fool with a capital F right here, right here, capital F right on my forehead, fool. But let me tell you something about a fool. I know this firsthand, but now I can see it in the word of God. Proverbs 13, 20. This is not in your bulletin or anything, but I want to give it to you anyways. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. A companion of fools, because what is a fool like? More fools to hang out with. Fools love more fools, man. We get, we get more foolish and the bigger our crowd gets. And I was exactly that kind of person. I love other fools that were never checking me on my foolish behavior. Okay, let me tell you a quick story about me. This is a sad story, actually. Um, so, um, yeah, so I had a friend growing up. I was young. I was a teenager, but I was a young teenager, barely had had my driver's license for a little tiny bit, and I had this, and we were fools, okay, we were, we were all up in the mix of it, we were, we were doing drugs and drinking, and we were just partying, and I had already given up school, and I have that kind of background where I got saved as an adult, in case any of you didn't know that, it's obvious now, but uh, my friend and I, you know, we're, we're teenagers, young, and my friend had never driven before, and my friend looks at me, and you know, we're both just knuckleheading around, we don't care about anything, and he, he looks at me, hey, let me, let me try driving your car. Let me try driving your truck. I had a nice little uh, um, Toyota pickup truck, so old it didn't even have a, 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 a model. <laughs> you know the ones? Yeah. It didn't even, it's just a Toyota. Like that's all there was. Like what kind of truck, what kind of truck is it? Toyota. That's it. Um, and he, so he gets in the driver's seat and I'm like, sure, whatever, I don't care. Throw the keys over there. He turns it on uh, and he steps on it. Bam. Hits a guy. Hits a guy. Hits him bad. Matter of fact, this guy lost his leg forever, this guy that we hit. And it was a really, really sad day, really sad situation where um, my foolishness and us hanging around with each other and just being fools feeding off each other, that's what happened. And, ge and guess who got in trouble? Guess who went to jail? Me. I did. I went to jail. That was my first time going to jail right there was because a companion of fools suffers harm. And I was heartbroken over that. But let me tell you, I wasn't heartbroken enough to stop with my foolish behavior. Okay? I kept on going. And I kept on fooling around, and I kept on bringing foolish people around me, and I kept on doing all this until one day, one day, I got some wise advice. I was there, and, you know, jail's my background, so just try and bear with me. I was in jail there, and there was somebody there who, who, knew, who could see the path I was going on. And this person's in jail himself, okay? So it's not like I was taking advice from the wisest person ever. But in that moment, he looked at me, and he saw the path I was going on, the path of prison and and just hanging out there forever. And he looked at me and said, boy, you ain't going to make it. <laughs> you are not going to make it. You need to get out of this. So you should go to the Salvation Army. You should, you should just go over to that program over there and just go. And, you know, I was heartbroken enough at that time. So I was looking at, you know, having to be in jail for a really long time at that point, And I was heartbroken. I was going back and forth to court over and over again. And it just felt like it kept getting worse and worse every time I went. I was, I was devastated. I remember the last time I came back, I must have slept the whole, during the day, just the whole day, just so depressed, so depressed. So let me tell you about, and I, I actually did end up taking his advice, going to the Salvation Army, and that's how I got saved. That's how I got saved. And this is the, this is the, this is the cure. You see how we, how we had a cure? There's a cure for being a fool, but it's kind of unfortunate. Let me tell you the unfortunate cure for being a fool. It's tragedy. Tragedy. Tragedy is the cure. So when a, when a fool jumps off that cliff enough and begins to break enough bones and is in enough pain, they will finally start to say, would please, someone please tell me what's going on wrong here? Like, we've been telling you, man. You just weren't listening. That's, that's the unfortunate cure for being a fool is, is tragedy and heartbreak. And I wish it wasn't so, but a lot of you know it's true because some of you might be right in the middle of that. You're right in the middle of being a fool, and you're right in the middle of suffering tragedy. Let me tell you something about tragedy. God doesn't cause it, but he will use it. He doesn't cause your tragedy, but he will use it. He'll, he'll use it to knock on the door of your heart and say, hey, are you ready, though? Are you ready finally? You, you're, you're putting yourself through all this pain and heartache, and, you know, you keep getting into relationship after relationship, and you keep on, you know, you keep on going back to the addiction, back to the addiction. You keep on doing that. Are you ready, though? Are you ready to try it a different way? Are you ready to give your life to me completely? He'll use tragedy. He doesn't cause it, but he'll, he will let it happen. He will let it happen. And that's, it's unfortunate, but, but let me just tell you, 
let God use that tragedy to transform your life. Let God use the tragedy to transform your life. Every tragedy has a lesson in, that is equal to the significance of its heartbreak attached to it. So every time you go through a tragedy, um, I just got to be honest, most tragedies that we go through, not all, not all, but many are self-induced by, by decisions and choices we make. And every tragedy that we go through has a lesson associated with it. Um, I'm just saying that your pain has purpose. Your pain has purpose. And if you let God work with you in the midst of that pain, in the midst of that tragedy, in the midst of that heartache, he can bring you out to a place that you've never been before, a place that's higher than you've ever been before, if you will just accept the heartbreak and the tragedy and say, you know what, God, I'm done. I'm done. But if you're hard-headed like me, you got to go through a lot of heartache. And you got to mess up again. You got to mess up again. You got to say, well, I don't need to do all that. You mess up again. You mess up again. Don't let that ha- don't let that be you. Come on, new year, new you. Come on, let's jump in. Give God all of you. Give God all of yourself. That's why we tell people about growth track every single week. You know why? Is because we have labels stuck all over us and we get battered up in life it's like we're driving through life and we're just getting like hit from every side and next thing you know we're all like twisted up like this we want to get you through growth track so we can begin to mm, mm, ah, and take those labels off and put the correct labels on you no you're a you're a child of god no you're a daughter of the most high you're a you're a son of the most high no you are made you are set free You are the righteousness of God in Christ. When you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's who you are. And when we tell you about growth track every single time, it's because when you go through a tragedy and show up in church again, you know, and we'll be here. The doors will be open every year. But when you come back again, we want to finally get you into that place where you're saying, all right, all right, get me on the right path then. All right, I'm ready to kind of go the way you say I should go, God, and I'm ready to go on with you. I'm not trying to figure it out on my own anymore. And that's that's the unfortunate cure for being a fool is tragedy. But don't hate it. Embrace it and learn from it. And let someone wise come in and say, you know what? You ought to give your life to God. You ought to give your whole life to God. You ought to start living for him. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect right away. It just means you have to start taking steps in his direction one at a time. Just begin making those motions towards him, towards him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your path. He'll direct it, okay? So let me tell you about this next person. This person is my favorite. Not, it's the mocker. It's the mocker, the mocker, also known as the scoffer. You can write it down in your bulletin that way. If, if you, it depends on what translation you got. It might say the scoffer. It might say the mocker, but they're the same person. The mocker is the fool on steroids, all right? The mocker says, there's a cliff over there, huh? You're telling me I shouldn't do it, huh? But I'm going to long jump off that cliff, baby. I'm going for it. I'm ready to go all the way. And if you don't jump, you're an idiot. That's what the mocker says. The mocker comes after you if you're doing the right thing and they're doing the wrong thing. They will come after you. Man, that, love that guy, right? Got to love that guy. <laughs> not only do they not do the right thing, they criticize others who do the right thing. They control through criticism. They control through cri- None of you would, would do any of this ever. You know them from social media, everybody. Come on. If you don't know one in person, you definitely know. Just go on uh, Google Reviews. You'll, you'll find one in a heartbeat. They're the ones that have something nasty to say. They got like 23 reviews on their profile, and every single one of them is like, ah, oh, they're terrible, I hate them, they do this. And so, this is so funny. Sometimes you'll see somebody that wants, to, that wants to interject and be like, hey, hey, mocker, hey, scoffer, maybe you shouldn't be so harsh, you know? I'm, I'm reading what you're saying, and it's kind of extreme. Like, you're taking it way too far. And you think to yourself, you know, I'm going to come in and correct this mocker. I'm going to come in and speak some life to this mocker. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to tell this mocker and scoffer, you know, maybe you, shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't do that. Who's tried that before? Who's tried that before? The Bible is very clear. says don't do that. The Bible says don't do that. I'll show it to you right here, Proverbs 9. Whoever corrects a mocker, you're just inviting insults. All you're doing is saying, hey, mocker, over here, I'll engage with you. Why don't you come unleash your venom on me? I'm here. That's all you are doing. Bible says, 
just stay, just stay out of it. Stay out of their way. Because all they want to do is argue. And if you, spe- if you say a word, they will go, whoop, argue? You want to argue with me? Gotcha. That's what they'll do. You're inviting insults. And whoever rebukes of the wicked incurs abuse for themselves. And you don't need any more abuse in your life. You don't. You don't need that. You don't have to do that. The, the Bible actually says something here that you actually want to hear. You would think it would say, you know, you just got to love them through it and keep on talking to them. No, it doesn't say that. It says just don't. Just don't do it. Don't engage. Disengage. (laughs) Don't correct mockers or they will hate you. That's all you're going to get is hatred from them. When's the last time you saw people arguing on TV, two of them, you know, one's in New York and one's in L.A. And one's got a blue tie and one's got a red tie and they're arguing. And then one of them says, you know what? You're right. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to stop right now. I think, yeah, you got a point there. Never, never, never going to happen. Why? Because they live for debate. They live for it. They love it. And the more they do it, the more people engage with them, the more fired up they get about it. The more passionate they become about it. This is a mocker. Class A1 mocker. And we don't need it. You don't need it. They will only hate you more if you try to help them. In fact, if you're getting mad at me right now, I got news for you. You're a mocker, and I'm sorry to have to tell you that because I'm, you're just proving the Bible's true. If I'm, if I'm trying to rebuke you, if I'm trying to correct you, you're just going to hate me. And so, all right, I know none of you are like this. You, you guys are probably the ones that, are, you know, you want to help the poor mocker, right? That's you right there. But take, take my advice on this one. Take my advice. Don't engage in every conversation. God never asks you to do that. Nobody ever asks you to do that. And you're not doing anybody any favor. No, don't engage in every conversation. That doesn't mean you can't speak some life into certain conversations. But you, can, you know it when you see it, y'all. You're, you're, on, you're online. You see the computer screen. And you're like, that's a mocker right there. That's the guy Pastor was talking about right there. I see it. Just, just take your hand off the keyboard and don't do it. Don't do it. Because that, that's what a wise person will do. They won't engage. Now, this sounds a little hopeless for the mocker, doesn't it? Sounds a little like, so what's the answer? Just, you can't talk to them. So what, what's supposed to happen? The, the unfortunate cure for mockery and being a mocker is God. That's the only way. It's the only way. You will never get through to them. They need like Paul needed. Like Paul was persecuting the Christians back in the day. And what did God have to do? He came down and kicked him right off, right? Isn't that what he did? He had a God encounter that said, bam, that's what When you get to this point, that's what you need. That's what you need. See, I made it to to fool level, and I've dabbled in mockery. You know, we've all we've all dabbled in all of this. But I I used to run with some some world class like you can't talk to them. There needs to be a God encounter for them. So what you can do is this you can pray. You can pray that God would meet them where they're at and 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 try and help them. And that's my prayer for any of you that maybe you feel like you know, I've engaged in some of that. Like, not only have I engaged, I may have even instigated some of that. I may have been walking in a little bit of this. So my prayer for you is that, that God would meet you and shake you up a little bit so you, don't have to, so you don't have to live that way anymore. Number four. Number four. Last person I want to talk about is the wise. Finally, the wise. Let's talk about a wise person just for a second. The wise are not smarter. Let's just get that out of the way. The wise are not smarter. They're not more educated. They're not even the person who understands the Bible better. It's not even the person who's lived the longest. No. The wise person isn't any of those things. The wise person has a unique quality that I want to show you right now, straight from the word. You'll see it in Proverbs 9. I want you to catch this. Instruct the wise, and they'll be wiser. They'll say, thank you. When you come to the wise and say something that they need to know, they'll be like, oh, yeah, thank you. I receive that. I receive that. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. Wise people will say, wow, thank you for telling me that. I, know, I, I couldn't see that. You know what? I, I have a pastor in my life who, who said something about this topic. They said, I want to be open to even if a little kid came up to me, a little kid comes up to me and said, you know what? You talk too loud or whatever that he would say. He wants to say, you know what? I didn't see it that way. Thank you for sharing. Even if a little kid comes up to correct me, I want to be in a place in my life where I can receive correction no matter where it comes from. 
no matter if they're nice about it, no matter if they're mean. A wise person receives it and adds to their learning. That's what a wise person does. They say, thank you. Thank you for sharing that wisdom with me. Even if they don't run off and apply it to their life right away, because sometimes they get some advice that's just flat out dumb, but the wise person will never treat advice like that. Wise person always says, you know what? Thank you. Appreciate that. Didn't see it that way. Thank you. They are teachable. Write that down, please. Wise people are simply this, teachable. Not the smartest, not the oldest, don't know uh, philosophy the best or theology the best. They're just flat out teachable. That's what a wise person is, is they're teachable, pliable. And the wiser they get, the more open they are to receive correction. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like you're the smartest person in the room, but yet you're still acting like I could tell you something. That's what a wise person looks like. That's the way you feel around a wise person. They haven't put up that defense. You know the one where every time you try and tell them something, it's like, ah, ah, you know, ah, get away from me. Uh, uh-huh, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, heard that before. Yeah, oh, thank, they're looking at you like, uh-huh, uh-huh, mm, yeah, yeah, mm, well, I tried that, but no, it didn't work. That's that's not what wise people have done. Wise people have taken down that wall of defense. That they, don't, they don't make excuses anymore every time somebody shares something that might be off in their life. They listen, and they say thank you. Too many people these days are reliant and even proud of themselves. Reliant and even proud of themselves. But the wise are the ones who know how to receive correction. And they know how to grow wiser. So let me summarize these four people really fast for you, just like this. Correct the simple, and they won't understand you. They'll be like, what? I don't get it. They're too young. They don't get it. They're young and dumb. It's all right. Correct the simple, they won't get you. Correct the fool, they will ignore you. Get out of here with all that. I know what I'm doing. I'm fun. It's all right. Correct the mocker, and they'll hate you. Correct the mocker, they'll get mad at you. But if you correct the wise, they'll thank you. That's how you see them. That's how you know who they are. So what I want to leave you with today is this beginning of wisdom. So this is the first Sunday of the year. This is the first message in this series. And what I want to tell you is what is the beginning? What is the beginning of wisdom? Let me tell you what it is. It's fear of the Lord. It's fear of the Lord. Listen to this in Proverbs 9. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's that, that fear is the beginning. That's where wisdom starts. Is this, is this, it's an attitude that says, God, wow, you're amazing. You're so big. Even, the, even what I'm standing on, you created. The clothes on my back, you created. You're so big. You created the mountains and the oceans. God, you're so big. I can't even, that's where wisdom starts, is with this awe and reverence. Now, some people would tell you um, that fear, you know, it doesn't mean being afraid. It just means having reverence. You know, all right, God, I salute you. You know, fear the Lord just means, you know, oh, you're God. Yep, you're God. You know, and if I were teaching in the deep south, I might, I might teach it that way too because they already got a fear of the Lord over there. Like, they're afraid of everything, man. If I don't come to church on Sundays, man, I'm going straight to hill. I'm coming to the altar every single Sunday. But in California, we got a different problem. In California, we got a different problem. We, we, we don't have a fear of the Lord. We, we think we got it all. We're progressive contemporary. We know what's, we know what's up. Man, we're good. We know. Man, all those guys over there, man. But let me tell you, this word, fear of the Lord, it means terror. It means to be afraid. And it also means, you know, caution to have respect for some. Like you stand at the edge of a cliff. It's like that cliff is not trying to hurt you. You're just afraid of it because it's like I could fall, right? That's, that's, that's what we're talking about here. It, it means to be afraid. But listen, no one is more loving and caring than God, okay? Don't miss me on that. No one is more loving, caring, and gentle, and merciful. I mean, what, the one thing he wants is a relationship with you. And he is willing to sacrifice everything to get it. He loves you. He loves you. So he's not coming to, to scare you and, you know, frighten you into, you know, we got to do, you know, have this transactional faith where, you know, I have to do and do and do, and then God won't be mad at me anymore. That's not, that's not it at all. But make no mistake, wisdom comes from fear. <laughs> wisdom comes from fear. Like, think about it this way. What, what if this was a cliff? You know, a wise person wouldn't be like, 
oh, I don't know, who cares? Maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. A wise person would be like, I could lose my life if I'm not careful. And that's what this fear of the Lord is. I believe that God is real, and that should concern us. I believe that his words are real, and that should concern me. So what he promised, the good stuff and the bad stuff, might actually happen in my life if I take him and his words lightly. And that should scare some of us right now. In like, if it's true, then I'm sunk. I'm sunk. Let's take a look at three declarations that will keep us on track with the fear of the Lord. Number one, God is awesome. He's awesome. He's, he's, uh, he, God, you're big. You're great. Magnificent, powerful. God, you are awesome. And even when it doesn't look like you're moving like you should, you are moving exactly like you should. Even if I don't understand you and how I think you should be moving right now, you are moving exactly the way you should be moving right now because, God, you are awesome. Psalm 33 says it like this. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. Let everyone stand in awe of him. Sometimes people tell me that, you know, after the message is over, after church is over, sometimes during the week they, they tell me things like, oh, pastor, that was really good. And I really appreciate that. And something you said really changed my life. And don't get me wrong. I appreciate it. I, I, I'm always thankful. And I, and I do, you know, lo- love hearing that because it gives me confidence to know that God is really speaking through me. But every time that happens, i got to be honest with you. The thoughts that go running through my mind are how foolish I was the rest of my life. How simple I was. How simple I am. How, who am I to even give commentary on God's word? I don't deserve it. I don't, I am not, so when, when someone says something like that to me, I, the one thing I'm thinking about, and maybe you've had that experience too, where someone says something about, but you know what, God is awesome. It's only because God is awesome. When he can use someone like me, someone as dumb as me, someone as simple as me, someone as plain as me, someone who's done as many mistakes as me, when he can use me to do anything, man, that makes me remember how awesome God is. Because he can do anything with anyone, and that's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome right there. I don't mind that one bit. I don't mind that one bit. But it it goes like this, Isaiah 40. Do you not know? No. I don't. I don't know everything. Have Have you not heard? No. I haven't heard everything I need to hear. No. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding, no one can fathom. Who am I that he is mindful of me? that's, That's exactly what we need to start with this year. Who am I that God is mindful of me? Who am I? Because he could make me a grease spot on the ground right now. And with everything I've done, that's exactly what I deserve. Who am I that he's my... That's exactly the way we should be looking at God. God, you are awesome. You are amazing. And it's you first. And you always. And you last. And you first. And you in the middle. God, and nothing to do with me. You are awesome. You can we just start there, everybody? Can we start there for 2019? Can we just start by saying, you know what? God is awesome. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm struggling with, no matter what my circumstances are, God is awesome, and he's the one that has the answer to every problem in my life. God is awesome, awe-inspiring. I don't care if I'm a little horse. I'm going for it because my God is good. He's got my back, and he loves me. He's awesome. He's so awesome. You know, we got to go on to this next one. God is holy. God is holy. This next declaration is very, very important, especially in our culture today. I'll tell you why. I, I, I like the way we do church here. I do. I, I, the, with the colorful lights and the sound system and we got the TVs and the videos playing and the drum solo and the wood grain and then we got, the, we got merchandise in the back. I mean, it's like, it's kind of cool. I like it. And we, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to be attractive for the world so that the world can come in and see the glory of God. I just happen to believe that church should be uh, enjoyed and not simply endured. I, I happen to know for a fact that nine out of ten people who, who don't go to church today, are, they don't go because it's boring. And that's something we can totally do something. Without changing the message of God at all, we can totally fix that. 
we could talk. I was just talking to, I can't say who, but I was talking to someone just recently, and I'm like, hey, man, why don't you go to church anymore? You're up in church. He said, because it's so boring. I'm like, man, when's the last time you've been to church? I'm like, have you come to our church, man? Come to our church, man. It's fun. We try and have some fun. Like, I tell jokes sometimes. Like, we do. We have song. Like, it's, it's kind of cool. Like, and we're going to continue to go that route. But make no mistake about it. We don't have some contemporary view of God. God is holy. And no matter what we do around here in colorful shirts and with the lights and the, if we have smug moving lights and all this, let me tell you something. God is holy. And when he walks in the room, it's not, hey, what's up? What's up, God? You know, oh, big man upstairs. No, it's, it's my Lord, my God. And when he walks in the room, I, sh- I shut my mouth. And whatever you need, God. We do not have a light-hearted, contemporary view of God where we make light of God to exemplify what we're doing here at church. No way, not ever. Not ever. Because God is holy. And first things first, that's where wisdom comes from, is knowing that he is holy and above all things. So no matter if we're meeting in a hut (laughs) with no heating and air, you know, walking 10 miles uphill both ways, or having heating and air conditioning with moving lights and haze and all that. It doesn't matter. God is holy. And we're going to do everything we can to lead people into an encounter with God. That's it. That's it. God is holy. Not for a second will, be caught, will we be caught in any kind of behavior that makes God light. That, that lightens God's heavy. Because it's heavy, man. God is real. He's holy. He's a holy God. I want, you, I want you to, I'm saying it over and over again because I want you to hear it. It's so important that we can walk around with this casual idea of, of who God is, this casual idea of, you know, I can just barely, you know, get by and, you know, whatever. It's cool. He likes me. It's fine. He loves you, but he's a holy God. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of skilled living. Is having that fear saying, you know what? God ain't my homie. We are friends of God, but he, he is not my homie. He is my Lord, my King, my Father in heaven. And the sheer fact that he would come close to me is honoring enough for me. Psalm 99 says, exalt the Lord our God. Bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Are we talking about an Old Testament mad God? Absolutely not. Hebrews 12, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. With reverence and awe. I don't care how contemporary the music gets around here. I don't care how fast the moving lights go. I don't care. We're going to worship him with reverence and awe. And if he says unplug it all, I'm going to unplug it all. (laughs) That's all there is to it because our God is holy. And when he says jump, I say how high, sir. That's all there is to it. He's a holy, he's a holy God. He's awesome. He's holy. And here's the last one. He's right. The last one is that God is right. He is absolutely 100% every single time he's right. He's right. When you see it one way, when, when you see it one way and God sees it another, he's right. <laughs> when you have one emotion and God has another, God's right. Let God be true and every man a liar. God is right every single time. And there's a lot out there right now. There's a lot out there, not just in culture, but in churches too. Where it's like, well, you know, it's, it's how they say in the South, you know, they're getting too big for their britches. Well, you know, oh, I know it says that, you know. But, you know, you can't believe everything the Bible says. You wouldn't believe this, but it's true. You you can't believe everything. And people teach this. You can't believe it. Not not everything. Not not all of it. Like what? Like what are you going to tell me right now that's not? Well, a man can't live in the belly of a whale for three days. I mean, that can't can't be real. Well, you know what? I happen to not believe that either. No, it's it's impossible for a man to live in the belly of a whale for three days. But it's also impossible to, to walk through the sea on dry ground. It's also impossible for a virgin to have a baby. It's also impossible for Jesus to walk on water. It's impossible for Lazarus to come out of his grave. It doesn't prove that the Bible's wrong. It proves that God is awesome. It proves that God can do anything. It proves that no matter how unbelievable it is, uh, God is right. He's right. And a fear of the Lord 
is the beginning of wisdom. And we come in and too big for our britches say, well, you know, oh, well, look at that. No, that can't be right. Oh, yes, it can. It absolutely is right. It is right. And that's where wisdom begins is having a trust and saying, you know what, and I'm not asking anybody, you know, like, put your, your dumb glasses on. You don't have to be dumb to be a Christian. Not at all. It actually takes, it, it takes faith. It's called having faith. Believing, yes, there are some impossible things in God's word. But who am I to tell the creator of the universe what he can and can't do? No. No. No, we're not going to do that. We're, we're never going to do that. Yeah, it's, it's not possible for some of these things to happen. But let me tell you something out of, out of Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's perfect. Reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And that's my heart for us today. Man, if, if we've been stumbling with being a little simple, being a little foolish, I want us to be wise. Nick, actually, come on up here, man. We're going to finish this up really, right now. Come on up and help me, help me close this service. The precepts of the Lord are right. Listen to this, giving joy. Can anybody use more joy in 2019, anybody? Can anybody use a little bit more encouragement, a little bit more joy in their life? I know I'm not the only one. Now, I could use a little bit more joy. Just because I stand up here with a microphone, man, doesn't mean I don't get depressed. And I want more joy in my life. I need more encouragement in my own life. And what does it say? The precepts of the Lord, his words, what his Bible says are right, and they give joy. Get, let's get in our word this year. Let's get in our Bible this year. Crap. Blow the dust off that Bible. Start reading that thing. Read through it in one year. Let this year be the year. You can do it right now. Giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, more pure, more pure than gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. So we all stand warned today. Like we, we know the Bible is true. We, we've heard it. But are we going to be full? We say, nah, I know it says that. I don't need to do it. I'm having fun. It's, it's fine. You're probably not even having that much fun anyways. <laughs> You're just trying to do it on your own. Don't do that. Don't do that. By them is your servant warned, and this is the last part. In keeping them, there is great reward. There is great reward. Man, if you would just follow his ways, if you would just dive into your word and, and begin to let that be the vessel, let that be the guide. Let his word be the guide for your life. There is a great reward in that. Amen, everybody? And his word brings life. God is life. That's what I'm asking you to believe, that he's right. And if you follow his way, it works. His way works better than our way, better than my way, better than your, it, his way. And here's the whole message in a verse. The whole message is in this one verse right here, Proverbs 19. Fear of the Lord leads to life. Fear of the Lord leads to life bringing security and protection from harm. So here's a little bit of wisdom. And you can write this in. This is the last little thing to write down. This is a little statement I want you to remember. This is a little bit of wisdom you can walk around with every day, rest of your life. And you can think about this message if you want, but just think about his word. When I understand what it means to fear God, I can live fearlessly. <laughs> you ready to live fearlessly in 2019? Anybody ready to live fearlessly? When I understand the fear of the Lord, when I fear the Lord, I don't have to fear anything else. There is only one kind of fear I need. Fear the Lord. I believe his word is true. I believe his word is right. Let today be the beginning for you. Let today be the beginning of a new path, a new way. I want to ask you to take a step of faith today. As you bow your heads and close your eyes with me, I want to just pray for you. Because I believe that there are many of you right here, right now, and even some of you listening online, where 
you've never heard it this way before and you've never you've never considered this you've never considered giving your life to Jesus and and how that might impact your life in a beautiful way let me just encourage you to take that step of faith today it's the first Sunday of the new year let today mark the day where the first part of this new year I gave my life to Jesus and I gave it to him full I don't have to be perfect I don't have to bring my perfection to him I don't have to bring how how awesome I think I am to him no it's I'm just bringing myself to you in everything I am so maybe you used to have a relationship with him but something happened along the way I want to give you an invitation right now to reaffirm that relationship with the Lord. And maybe you have never, never considered giving your life to Jesus. Let today be the day. And I just want to ask you in the privacy of this moment, as everybody's got their heads down, their eyes closed, I want you to start just between you and him and just lift your hand and say, God, I'm here for you. I want to give my life to you. Go ahead, lift your hand up high. You can do it. Be bold. Amen. I see you. Amen. I see you. Amen goes for all of us too, right? Let's all pray this prayer together. Father, I give myself to you. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross to take my sins on himself. I give my life to you. All my pain, all my trouble, all my mistakes, everything. You can have it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we clap our hands today? Amen. Amen. All right, as the ushers are coming up, I got a couple next steps for you. Before y'all go, um, this is something we say around here a lot. Don't hit a home run without running the bases, okay? Some of you, made a, some of you hit a home run today. You said you made the best decision of your life. You raised your hand and said, this is, this is my day. This is my year. I'm giving it to God. Well, don't hit a home run and then just stand there in the batter's box. We got some next steps for you. We got first, second, third, and home run. We got, we got it all set up for you. So step number one, we would love for you to sign up to get baptized. You can sign up in the back, and some of our team will help you sign up. We had baptisms last week. It was a blast. We always have a good time with baptisms. Baptism is this. You made an inward decision, and now I'm going to make an outward declaration to say, here I am, everybody. I'm, I'm giving my life to you. We would love to take that step with you. And uh, if you're ready for that, just go ahead and sign up in the back. Next step, after that, grow track. But grow track could be your very first step because this is a big one. Now, this is what I want to tell you. Every, any question you have, pastor, how do I get involved with the church? Pastor, how do I become a member? Pastor, how do I get on one of the teams? Pastor, how do I join the worship team? Pastor, how do I start a life? It's all growth track. <laughs> the answer to everything is growth track. So don't, don't ask me how to do it. It's all in gro growth track is where you learn more about who we are. Growth track is how you learn more about who you are and what your spiritual gifts are. Growth track is how you learn how to be a leader. Growth track is where you learn all about lifeline. Growth track is where you learn about all of our, it's everything. It's everything. So some of you are still waiting to take that next step. Let 2019 be the time for you. Um, it's every single Sunday during the second service. So go ahead and, and get committed. 2019, your year, go ahead, get in and join the team who's trying to reach the community with the love of God. Amen? Amen. All right, last next step is this. I want you to join a life group because we all got a little bit of simple in us. <laughs> and we need people in there saying, no, don't do it. The life group season is starting very soon in February. And so right now is the perfect time for you to sign up and, and maybe even say, you know, I want to start a life group. Or maybe you just want to be a part of one. That's cool, too. I'd love for everyone to take a connection card out of the seat back in front of you. Go ahead, everybody. We got plenty of paper. Everybody take one right now. Go ahead, everybody take a connection card. And if you're ready to take any of those next steps, I'd love for you to indicate that on that card and just put your name and your number or any, any way for us to get a hold of you. And we're not going to break your door down or bug you or anything. We just want to help you and take some of these next steps with you. Oh, yeah, and one last thing. We do ties and offerings in the basket, too. But most importantly... I'd love to see you take that next step. All right, so, so take a step towards God. You don't have to be perfect to take a step towards God. It's just one step and another step and another step. So the ways to give are right there. Um, just go ahead and between you and the Lord, Lord, what should I give? 
And if you're new here, please don't feel pressured or obligated. I want to pray over the offering right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for advancing your kingdom through these tithes and offerings. I pray they would be multiplied in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ushers. You can start sending those around. Now, I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to take, I'm going to take a little... Do you got an extra five minutes, everybody? Well, you guys are like, no, not really. It's okay. Your kids are in childcare. You'll be fine. But I want to tell you about something really exciting coming up that's starting tomorrow. Starting tomorrow. But I'm going to save that for last. On Wednesday, we've got equipped classes starting. And we're starting with a night of worship this Wednesday. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You can clap for that. I'm cool with that. And there's childcare there too. So like, I don't know if I'm in for a night of worship, but I'm definitely in for some free child care. Come on, somebody. Come on down for that. I don't care. Come on down. Man, take advantage of the system. Y'all do it. It's all good. But let me tell you, um, we starting, we're starting it off with a night of worship, and then we're launching all of our equipped classes on every Wednesday after that. So it's every Wednesday, starting this next Wednesday, and it's going to be powerful. Even if you haven't signed up for any equipped classes, come to the worship night and let God speak to you about what class to take. And it, you could just you could just learn right there. He'd be like, I want you to take the blessed life. I want you to take OSL. We'll tell you all about it right there. But here's the thing. We're starting prayer and fasting tomorrow. We're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. All right? And this is a big deal for us because we want to give the Lord our first and our best this year. We want 2019 to be the best year Lifeline has ever experienced. And that means we want, we want it to be the best year you've ever experienced. And this can be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your life spiritually. If you'll put your spirit, your spirit man first, if you'll, if you'll say, I'm, I'm going to feed my spirit, but I'm going to starve my flesh, let me tell you, it's going to be the best year of your life. Best year of your life. And we want to give it to him first because we know that Matthew 6.33 says, seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be taken care of for you. Everything else will be taken care of for you. So here's what's happening. There's a war going on in your life, a war between the life you are living and the life you could be living. It's a tension. It's like, I know I could be living at a higher level. I could be living at a different level, but I'm not. And that's the war that we face all the time. And here's the problem with that war. We're, we tend to be losing it because one of two reasons. We're disconnected from God or we're too connected to the world. We're either disconnected from God or we're too connected to this world. We're asking God to speak into our lives. Hey, God, hey, hey, I need you to speak into my life. Please, God, would you please show me, you know, the scripture says to, you know, that you'll make my path straight and everything. Would you please speak to me? And God says, okay, I'll speak to you. Still small voice. And we're like, what? I can't hear you over the music industry. I can't hear you over my radio. I can't hear you over Netflix binging. I can't hear you over social media. I can't, I can't hear you. And we can't hear God because there's so much other noise. It's not that he's not speaking. It's just that we can't hear him. We can't hear him and all that. And God is saying, turn that down and you'll hear me just fine. Turn that down, you'll hear me just fine. We need to silence the voice of the world so we can hear the voice of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right, this happens to the disciples too. I want to teach you just for a second. I want to teach you about this. Matthew 17 goes like this. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? They were trying to cast out a demon. They, they came to Jesus and said, we have this issue. We're trying to deal with it, but we can't cast it out. Jesus, what's the deal? Help us. And Jesus said to them, it's because of your unbelief. So first of all, we got to grow our faith. We got to grow our faith. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Someone said it's like a growing faith. A mustard seed faith is like growing faith. It, it could be small, but it grows. It grows, and it continues to, if it takes in that water, and it's on good soil, it'll grow. And then Jesus said this, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There are some issues in your life that will only come out due to prayer and fasting. Listen to this. Prayer connects us to God. Prayer connects us to God. And prayer is just talking, everybody. If you know how to talk, you know how to pray. Congratulations. You've just finished prayer 101. Talk to God. And I just hereby release you from praying in the King James Version right now. I beseech thee, O Lord. You don't have to pray like that. You don't have to. You just pray like you talk. Hey, God, I'm, 
I've got this issue in my life. Can you help me with it? It's, it's easy. Just talk to him. But fasting, and I, I'm sorry for if you don't know much about fasting. I'm going to try and fix that right now. Fasting disconnects us from the world. Fasting disconnects us from the world. I'm going to fix that right now. So, so for prayer, we're meeting here every day for the next 21 days. Tomorrow, starting tomorrow, 6 o'clock every single day, you will find us here. And I want to encourage every single one of you to try and make it out. And even if you can't make it every time, just come out. And we're not going to put a microphone in your hand. We're not going to make you confess all your sins to a group of people. Man, it's just you come in. We have some music playing. and You just pray. But there's something that happens when you enter into a context of there's a whole group of us. And, and we're all filled with faith. And we're all seeking the Lord. And you're praying on your own in a chair or something. But there's something powerful that happens in that context. I want to invite every single one of you to be a part of that every day for the next 21 days, okay? Six o'clock. Now about fasting. It's not a diet. It's not a cleanse. I don't know why they call it a fast because there's nothing fast about it. It's very slow. It, it hurts. There's pain associated with it, but that's kind of the point. Not that we were trying to punish ourselves and trying to hurt ourselves, but we're trying to tell our body and our flesh, you don't control me. You don't own me. I can tell you no whenever I want. My spirit is strong, but I'm starving my flesh. No flesh. I'm not going to give you everything you want all the time. No. So let me tell you about a, a few different kinds of fasts that you can choose from. There's a complete fast, a complete fast where you're just drinking water. And I would not recommend this unless you've talked to your doctor. But some of you have participated in like a significant kind of only water, only drinking Someone said, only drinking? I can do that. I'm talking about water and juice, okay? Y'all, not that kind of church, all right? Not that kind of church. Only drinking, only fluids. And I'm actually going to be trying to tackle that kind of fast myself where I'm drinking only fluids because I want this to be the best year of my life spiritually. So I want to I tell my body no. And my body loves a cheeseburger. Come on, somebody. And uh, there's also a selective fast. There's also a selective fast where you're fasting certain kinds of food. So if you were tuning me out for that last fast, wake up and listen to a more practical one that maybe you want to start with. It's called the selective fast, like the Daniel fast. Maybe you've heard of a Daniel fast where you're just, you're not going to eat meat for 21 days. You're not going to eat sugar for 21 days. I'm going to fast caffeine for 21 days. Some of you are like, oh, heck no. Oh, he I, I love Jesus and everything, but not like that, all right? <laughs> crazy, crazy fasting, man. This is selective fast, but you could choose. Like, I'm, I'm going to choose to not eat these. I'm going to choose to eat. These are all biblical. These are all found in the Bible. All these kinds of fasts are found in the Bible. There's a partial fast where you can give up, you know, one meal. I'm going to give up breakfast. I'm going to give up lunch. I'm going to give up dinner. But let me remind you, um, fasting without prayer is just a diet. Okay, so it's supposed to be partnered with prayer. Partnered with prayer. And we're, supposed to, we're saying no to our flesh and yes to our spirit. And then there's my favorite one. And I would encourage all of you to engage with this at some level. It's called a soul fast. A soul fast. This is where you would give up social media, movies, TV. Maybe some of you can't even breathe I'm, as I'm talking about this. You're like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Oh, my God. No. So, but that's how your soul feels. When you feed it everything it wants all the time. Your soul is like, <gasps> can't breathe, but your flesh is happy, but your soul is starving. But we want, our, we want our spirit man to be strong, but we want our flesh to be weak. That's exactly what I'm talking about right here. If you got a heartbeat, you know, just listening to that kind of fast, I would love for you to consider trying to participate at some level in that. The tendency is to starve our soul and to flee, feed our flesh whatever it wants. But what if the first part of this year we would starve our flesh and feed our soul? How much different would this year be? Come on. When you engage with prayer and fasting with us this year, I want you to, I want you to look forward to high expectations. I want you to look forward to God doing something powerful in your life. I'm, I'm making a promise to you. If you engage with me, with us, with this church, with prayer and fasting the next 21 days, I'm, I'm promising you. God is going to show up in a way that maybe he never has before. And this could be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your life spiritually. So would you please consider joining us starting tomorrow for prayer and fasting. If you need more information, as always, you can always get a hold of us and, and get more resources on that.
I'm going to go ahead and pray and let you guys out of here. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for every single person here. We're so grateful and thankful for everything that you're doing in this place. Thank you for, for the souls that have been saved today. Thank you for, for making us new in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, that you are, you are doing a new thing in this new year for us. Lord, I pray a blessing over every single person here. Lord, that, that anybody struggling with illness and sickness would, would have a miraculous healing. Anybody struggling with, with debt or any kind of financial problems because of this uh, holiday season we just faced, Lord, I pray for a peace that surpasses understanding. And Lord, that we will put you first and see the fruit that is associated with putting you first. Amen.